Today's podcast focuses on a growing and disturbing phenomenon that can best be described with a quote from Stephen Chbosky, author of The Perks of Being a Wallflower. Here's what he said, banning books gives us silence when we need speech. It closes our ears when we need to listen. It makes us blind when we need sight. His coming-of-age novel has faced censorship in the U.S. and Canada, but Chbosky isn't the only author who has been targeted by groups and individuals intent on undermining one of the pillars of democracy. I'm Bertram D'Souza, retired editorial page editor and Sunday columnist of the now-closed Youngstown Vindicator and author of No Holes Barred, a book dedicated to the 150-year-old newspaper. It's a self-published book, and that has given me and my colleagues, Cynthia Rickard and Robert McFerrin, both veterans of the Vindicator, great insight into the value and importance of the printed word. No Holes Barred can be purchased at Barnes & Noble in Boardman and online at www.scribblergroup.com. Last week was Banned Books Week, which highlighted the ever-growing campaign in this country against books that some find objectionable. The American Library Association turned the nation's attention to this dangerous phenomenon with a study showing that the number of books being challenged this year already is higher than those challenged in 2021. So what's going on? To answer that question, I've invited two individuals who are deeply immersed in books through their roles as librarians. Deborah Caldwell Stone is director of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom. Ms. Caldwell Stone has been quoted extensively in the national media about the association's study and what's going on around the country, both in public and school libraries. Erin Femester, is the Public Library of Youngstown and Mahoning County's Chief Experience Officer. She has a front row seat to how libraries in our region are dealing with the ever-changing world of the written world. Thank you, Deborah and Erin, for joining me to discuss what I believe is one of the most important issues facing the nation today. Before I uh, ask any questions and we get into the discussion, uh, I'd like each of you to tell us a little about yourselves, uh, how you got interested in books and libraries, and uh, and what exactly you know is your role? Uh, you, Deborah, with the uh, American Library Association, and you, Erin, with uh, the Youngstown Mahoney County Library. So, Deborah, if you would go first and and uh, you know introduce yourself and tell us something about yourself. Well, I'm Deborah Caldwell Stone. I am the director of the American Library Association's Office for Intellectual Freedom. And it's the office within the association that's responsible for developing a complete program to protect uh, intellectual freedom, uh, uh, to protect the right to read, protect the right to access information, um, and more broadly, protect the First Amendment right to publish, to speak, uh, to essentially assure that the free flow of information takes place in this country. Um, as Part of that work, we highlight uh, incidents of censorship in school and public libraries. Uh, we collect data about censorship incidents. Uh, we provide direct support to libraries and library library workers who are addressing censorship in their libraries and in their communities. Um, and we also engage in advocacy, such as um, this podcast, for example, right. to talk what we're observing and and how we would hope uh, it could be addressed, including tools for communities to use to fight censorship in their communities. Okay. How, how did you get involved in, in, in this business, in your business? What prompted your interest? I've been a lifelong reader, uh, an early reader, um, and, and so I've always had a love for books, libraries in particular, because as someone who grew up without a lot, um, going to the library in my bike with a basket to collect lots of books was very important to me. So that was part of the background. But as I um, uh, engaged in my education, I was a college journalist. I wow. was fascinated by First Amendment issues. And so when I went to law school, I made a, a study of First Amendment freedom, civil liberties as part of my coursework. Um, and ALA, um, almost two decades ago now, mm-hmm. in fact, two decades ago now, offered me the opportunity to put that all to work in the service of libraries. And I, I couldn't have imagined a more 
fitting or ideal job for all that I, you know, my background, my interests, my learning. Uh, and it all kind of came together to do this work for the association. Uh, so I was deputy director uh, for law and policy related to First Amendment issues um, and privacy issues as well for a many number of years. But eventually I moved into the directorship of the office as a whole. Okay. Hi, Aaron. Um, tell us about yourself and, and how you got involved in, in the library and, uh, you know, a little about of your background. And thank you again for joining me. Absolutely, I'm thrilled to be here. I am Erin Femister with the Public Library of Youngstown and Mahoning County. I'm the Chief Experience Officer. So I oversee our programming, marketing, and outreach to the community through the library uh, for our leadership team here at the library. And uh, what that basically means is I get to do the fun stuff. I get to work with patrons of all ages to help them to discover something new. And I get to tell people about those things that are happening at the library. So it's a very fun role. And I came to this role after working as a librarian in several other locations, uh, focusing on youth and programming throughout my career because books are important and information is so vital, but helping people to know that those things are there through our programming is something that I love being able to do. Um, and I came into libraries because I was a senior in college trying to figure out what master's degree program I wanted to go into since I had a liberal arts degree. And I was in the library for the third or fourth time looking for uh, some career books. And one of the librarians said to me, I see you in here hanging out with kids, doing some, some babysitting. Have you thought about librarianship? You love mm. coming into the library with kids. You share stories with them. Have you thought about it as a career? And I said, no, I hadn't even realized you needed a master's degree for it. So she pointed me in the direction and I started investigating and it felt like something that really worked out for me. And so I was lucky enough to join a master's degree program and get an internship in public librarianship, which I had not been thinking about. And I found that public librarianship is a place where you can really serve people and help people find the information they need, find the resources they need. And so uh been to a few different libraries and i fall in love with it every day great okay uh, let me start uh by quoting you uh deborah after the american library association released its study on book banning in 2022 uh, here's what you said in part quote i have never seen anything like this it's both the number of challenges and the kinds of challenges it used to be a parent had learned about a given book and had an issue with it. Now we see campaigns where organizations are compiling a list of books without necessarily reading or even looking at them. So, uh, Deborah, and then I'll come to you, Erin. What's driving this book banning campaign that seems to be spreading or that is spreading around the country? Well, Richard, we're seeing uh, partisan advocacy groups some claiming to be parents' rights groups, others with more political bent, um, arguing that some books are un-American or uh, unsuitable for minors to read because they touch on issues related to gender identity, sexual orientation. Um, are books intended to provide information about puberty, changing bodies, how babies are made. Uh, they often have moral and political objections to much of this material. Um, and, and so they see, for whatever reason, they see it as a threat um, to have these materials available in public libraries, but also school libraries. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing them organize their local chapters um, to go to school board meetings, library board meetings, and to demand the removal of these books. They've been most successful in the school library realm. Um, right. they, they've been very successful in several states and really having hundreds of books removed that they deem to be un-American or Marxist because they deal with race and racism from perspectives that they don't agree with um, or that represent um, uh, the lives and experiences of LGBTQIA persons and families. Um, we are seeing less, they're seeing having less success in public libraries, um, but they are having some success in public libraries. And so we're deeply concerned about this, or, you know, a real targeting of um, the ability of every person to find 
a wide range of materials, viewpoints in their public library, uh, and to read and make up their own minds about these issues. Uh, it really does feel like an effort to limit access to information in order to impose uh, orthodoxy on some kinds of political thought and uh, what is thought about in, in communities, uh, particularly for young people. Okay. Aaron, um, and I'm, I'm sure you've seen the uh, ALA study that showed there were 681 challenges to books through the first eight months of this year involving 1,651 different titles. What was your reaction when you learned that these numbers already approached last year's totals, which were highest in decades? I think when I see that um, being in public libraries and, and you know hearing some of the concerns that people have about these books, I think that it it's disheartening. Uh, but I also think that we are lucky here in Youngstown because when people have brought questions to us, we have thus far been able to have conversations with folks on an individual level and and speak with them about what is the specific concern and you know point out that taking this book off the shelf doesn't just mean taking it away from you it means taking it away from everyone in the community so right. by being able to have those conversations we have been able to use this as an opportunity to share information about if you have a concern or a question that's one thing, but if you're demanding a ban, that's that's a different conversation. So by by helping people and providing this, using this as an education opportunity in our conversations, it's it's been, I think, on a person to person basis, it's been helpful, and it's been the way that we've been able to help people to see, it's it's not just about taking something away that you disagree with. It's taking away that access, taking away that opportunity. And something that, generally speaking, library, the public library is here for open access, so. Yeah. Yeah. And Deborah, what 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 uh, Erin just explained seems to be a very reasonable approach because fortunately for them in the Youngstown and Mahoney County Library, there seem to be, even if people have objections, there seem to be reasonable people who are willing to sit down and have a conversation. But that's not, a, that's not what's going on around, mostly around the country. Because I read stories where librarians themselves have been threatened, where you know, libraries have been, there have been demonstrations and all of that. Um, so give us a, some perspective as to what form this, uh, the, this sort of campaign against books is taking. Well. It's very much a political wedge issue um, in this election year. Um, and I think that there are a number of uh, political advocates that are taking advantage of the current uh, climate in our country, the divisions, um, introducing moral panics. And so, um, and they are not shy about using almost every tool available to them, including um, social media intimidation threats. Um, we've actually heard from libraries that um, books have been returned in their book drop with bullets shot oh. into the book. A um, uh, library received a letter threatening uh, retribution for holding uh, LGBT themed programming, and there was a bullet in the letter. And, and so we're seeing a real coarsening of the public discourse, a real unwillingness to engage in conversation, to exercise tolerance, uh, to act in a way that understands that uh, libraries are a shared community resource. And that while there might not be something, not everything there in the library would meet your needs or you might not agree with, the, there are books there that do meet your needs, that there are resources that are there for you. Um, and we share this institution with others who may not necessarily agree with us. Um, but I think we're, unfortunate libraries have become a nexus for uh, political activity, uh, political advocacy, um, and a real target for some groups that really want to silence the voices of marginalized communities um, who more recently found a place on the public stage. And somehow they, you know, 
it's also, um, you know, quite frankly, it's a, a messaging tool. Uh, if we take the books that reflect your life and your interests off the right. shelf, you're excluded from the community. You don't belong here. Um, if we silence these voices, maybe we can impose an orthodoxy of belief, political belief, religious belief on the community. Um, I think that's all in vain. Um, I think oh, it's, that it's gone. Yeah, history okay. has an approach to be wrong, but it doesn't prevent uh, individuals who are feeling um, a lack of power these days or wanting to achieve a political goal from using libraries as a means of messaging, as a tool um, to achieve their goals. Uh, and, and Aaron, um, when, when the, the public library of, of, of Youngstown and Mahoning County uh, decides what books to have on its shelves, um, what kind of process is used? I mean, how, how do you determine what books to carry in, in the main library and the branches uh, at, or on you know, audio books or whatever? Uh, what, what process do you go through? So we have a selection policy, which I think most libraries do, and we use a variety of criteria um, that focuses on uh, community needs, interest, um, how well a book is reviewed, professionally reviewed, how popular an item is, and we also try to attain, attain a level of diversity in our collection. So we do have books that represent a variety of viewpoints, a variety of cultural backgrounds that represent all the marginalized voices in our community. So we try to use our selection policy to ensure that those voices and those individuals are represented in collection. And we use some best practices that we get from wonderful organizations, such as the American Library Association and the Ohio Library Council, so that we know that we're following the best practices we can to provide our community with a collection that represents a variety of viewpoints and information that they'll need in their daily life or in their just enjoyment reading. And, and this is for, for both of you. Um, last week was um, uh, the um, Banned Book Week um, that was promoted around the country, unfortunately, because of uh, the hurricane in Cuba, uh, I mean, in Puerto Rico, and then, of course, in Florida. It, it was, wasn't in the headlines, but even though so, there was national uh, publicity as far as the ALA's study goes. Um, but, you know, it struck me as I was doing some research on this that uh, I grew up in the third world. <clears throat> and and I, after high school, I did an apprenticeship with the daily English newspaper. And this was after Uganda, that's where I, I was born and grew up, uh, gained uh, independence. And the government had a censor stationed in the newsroom of the newspaper. And mm -hmm. he would censor stories that related to government and had final say on what was published. And and as I was going through and reading the ALA and reading all the other stories, it struck me that what's happening in this country today is not supposed to happen in the greatest democracy in the world because book banning is a linchpin of dictatorships. Uh, if you look at uh, the Second World War and Nazi Germany, Books were the first targets. Uh, they burned them, especially books written in the Jewish, by Jewish authors. Um, so it, in that regard, how disturbed are you as to what you find is happening in, in, in America today? And Deborah, if you would go first. Yeah, you know, I, I am so deeply disturbed by what's going on. Um, you know, I have... Uh, grown up in a country where I believed that uh, no government would tell me what to read, no government would step in and prevent the press from sharing information with the public or making information available. And I've seen that slowly 
turn around. And I, I realize that it's not perfect. I realize that there have been, you know, gaps. Uh, there have been suppression of information in the past. And certainly we can look back to the cultural history of the United States, the Comstock era, right. where there were government censors preventing certain works of literature from coming into the country, suppressing the publication of certain ideas because of sex or um, uh, moral objections. Uh, but I, you know, my, I, I used to say that we had reached a consensus here in the United States, that the government had no business in telling, uh, particularly adult readers, what to read, what right. to write, what to say. And I think that we're unfortunately finding ourselves back in another era where even if you might theoretically have freedom to publish and speak, where you theoretically have the freedom to read, there's a real effort um, to stigmatize uh, beliefs that others don't, you know, that some, that certain advocacy groups are found objectionable. Um, and, and to really go back to a McCarthy type era where it was, you know, you couldn't be identified with certain political, right. um, political ideas without putting your livelihood uh, and your status in society at risk. Um, and I, I do think that there is a real effort to target um, LGBTQIA persons and to silence them and, and to silence um, certain narratives around our history with slavery and racism sure. here in the United States that certainly reflect the viewpoints of those who were enslaved, who lived under racism uh, for so long a time. Uh, and to substitute uh, uh, a narrative that is more suited to some political viewpoints. Um, uh, and all I can say is that it's why I do this work. I want to give, make sure to preserve that right to think and read and choose for oneself, to not have the government tell me what to think or read, but to leave that decision for me, to have the freedom of belief um, and, and the freedom to explore a whole range of ideas and to make sure that my children, my relatives, my community members have that equal opportunity, no matter who they are, no matter what their background. And, and so um, I can only note the moment, uh, the, this time of authoritarian control over thought and ideas or an attempt to exercise that control and try to do all I can to resist it and to equip library professionals to resist it, to equip communities to resist it. Erin, as a library professional, you're on the front lines of this battle. Libraries are, and I, I have to say I'm very thankful to be working in the community where I am because there does seem to be an appreciation for that right to make the selection for yourself. And I know that not all librarians are in the same position that I am in. And so I am, I am very thankful to be able to work in a community where we do have that appreciation for being able to choose for yourself. Uh, you know, not speaking as a librarian, but speaking as a mother, I find it troubling that somebody would determine what my child can read. Right. And, and when you take that book away, you're, you're determining that for me. So I think it's important that we have that opportunity. And I think it's important that we remember that the library is a place that should be experienced as a family. If you have concerns about what your children might consume, please come to the library together. Please take the diligence you would take in monitoring their YouTube watching to determine the books that you think are appropriate for your child. And then there is the opportunity for other families to make that decision for themselves as well. So I, I think that I feel lucky in this moment to be where I am and I am hopeful that it is something that passes because access to information is the key to a future success. We live in the information age and taking away access to information, taking away the ability to explore ideas, stymies and prevents people from exploring something new, building empathy, discovering an idea. It might prevent the next great invention from happening sure. because somebody's worldview has been so limited. And, and, and this comes at a time when, and, and we had, you had mentioned, uh, Deborah, earlier, that not only public libraries under pressure, but 
the pressure is being felt even greater with school libraries, where school boards, many, most of them elected, have to respond to an electorate and a constituency. And when you have very vocal members in the community demanding that books be taken out of their, their school libraries, it almost seems that the public libraries in communities have be, should, should be uh, the places where books that have been banned by school districts can be found. Um, and yet, there are people in the community who are also targeting public libraries. So, given, given that dynamic, what can people, thoughtful people who believe in freedom of expression and, and freedom of speech and, you know, uh, who believe in the freedoms of, of this country, what can they do to counter this, this grow, what I consider to be a growing movement? Uh, well, you know, we have, you know, as you so uh, wonderfully present, you know, school politics are local. They're elected officials or they're appointed by elected officials to serve on boards. And I have to say, public libraries operate on the same system. They're governed by right. boards of trustees that are either elected or appointed by elected officials. So it's incumbent on everyone who wants to fight to preserve the freedom to read to be registered to vote, to engage at the local level, know what's going on at their local school board meetings, at their local library board meetings, and be prepared to speak out on issues of importance, including the ability uh, to learn without limitation, including the ability to read and make one's own choices uh, around the books in the public library, and to trust the library professionals and the education professionals to build collections of materials that serve the information needs of everyone in the community. We, we've actually um, put together a, a campaign platform for individuals and communities to use called Unite Against Book Bans. Um, it's at uniteagainstbookbans.org. And it's got a whole wealth of resources for individuals and community groups to use. Um, information about how library boards and school boards are structured, what individuals can do to reach out to elected officials and elected board members to have that conversation about the importance of preserving the freedom to learn and read as one chooses um, and ensuring, for example, that schools are providing a wide variety of viewpoints and information as part of their curriculum and not just limiting young people to one narrow view of history um, or limiting access to information uh, about um, puberty or sexual health, um, but instead leaving that solely to the parent to decide for their child, but providing for the information needs of other families in the community. Um, it really is important to be registered to vote, to know where the candidates stand, and to communicate your concerns to your local officials, and to counter the very loud voices of what we know to be a vocal minority that has pretty well had the field to themselves. But I think we're now seeing uh, a counter movement build when people realize what is lost when books are taken from both school libraries and public libraries. And I yeah. would Go add ahead. one, Sorry. you know, I just one last thing, you know, we do want, you know, public libraries certainly are the place where all books should be available. But we should remember too, that for many young people, school libraries may be the only library they really have access to. Not everyone has transportation. Right. Uh, or money or the ability to make use of a library. Um, the library may be an urban library and they're in the rural districts. Um, and so it's important to ensure that school libraries and school librarians are equipped to provide a diversity of information to young people that may not just reflect ideas in the classroom, but also reflect topics of interest to the young people as well so that they can prepare for adulthood to know, understand and gain empathy about controversial issues, uh, to know themselves and to know their colleagues and uh, fellow students. Erin, um, do you, uh, does the Public Library of Youngstown and Mullen County, 
you have outreach programs, right? And, and, but I don't know to what extent you go into schools and all of that. Um, so uh, talk, explain and talk about that a little bit. Sure. We have outreach programs. We have our pop-up library, which is, you know, similar to what some other libraries might call a bookmobile that visits communities, organizations, schools, and, uh, you know, community festivals, uh, assisted living facilities. So we do take our collection out to those um, to those organizations to support their needs. And we are lucky enough to partner with some of our school libraries to share information about, you know, a variety of things. Um, uh, Cause we do still have some school librarians, which I know is a challenge that can't, can't be said for all schools. A lot of schools have had to downsize and they've gotten rid of school librarians and school libraries. So we do work with our schools and their school librarians whenever possible to, you know, do some, uh, some fun things because the schools do have a variety of things they have to get through. So we support some of their information needs. And then we also work to collaboratively to do some fun activities such as uh, our teen poetry program that we do in April every year. Uh, and uh, we just did a six word memoirs with some of our schools. So we do collaborate with them in those ways. Uh, not sure if that's exactly where you were looking for me to go Bertram, but. No, that that's what, and cause I, I guess, Implicit in this whole uh, book banning um, campaign is the idea that people cannot be trusted to think for themselves. And that is a disturbing trend because that's also uh, shown in the whole abortion issue where mostly white male legislators around the country have decided that women, educated or not, college grads or not, cannot be trusted to make decisions about their own bodies. And so how do you, how do you fight back against that kind of a mentality? Deborah? Well, the idea that, uh, you know, it's a complex issue in that um, I think it's not only a matter of thinking that people can't be trusted, but that they can, in fact, can be trusted in, in making their own, you know, making decisions that don't comport with the agendas of those who would restrict access to information because they disapprove of a political viewpoint or a moral position that's taken by an author uh, or that promotes the voices of uh, those who are LGBTQIA, for example, uh, or who question our history with racism in the United States. Um, I think that there's a real fear that if people have a wide, uh, have broad access to information, that they will lose power. And so I see the restrictions on information as a true power play, a political power play, uh, with the belief that if they limit the ability to access uh, information and ideas that contradict their own, that they might be able to preserve their power, pre preserve their hegemony over uh, the levers of government and society. Uh, I, you know, and I, I think we've already mentioned that I think that's uh, a failing strategy in the long term. Um, but in the meantime, we're seeing uh, an incredible uh, uh, incident of um, censorship that is impacting the lives of both young readers, uh, adult readers, and library workers across the country. Um, and um, one can only do what one can to fight that. Um, and to promote the idea that every human being has dignity and has inherent rights that every that any government with a claim to legitimacy has to respect and protect um, and and say that as loudly as we can. Erin? I think it's important to remember that, uh, you know, we have libraries because we had people in the past who recognized that for our democracy to be a strong, thriving organization, we needed to have educated people voting. And while it hasn't always been true and it hasn't always been perfect, access to information for all individuals is the way that we have an educated population that can make decisions for themselves. And so uh, in all issues, I guess I am the ultimate librarian in all issues. I think information, more information is the key to 
moving forward. And so I think that by continuing to be an organization uh, in our community and in communities across our country that support information needs, we are here for you. And it's not just about the people who are trying to stop access to information. It's about the people who are trying to convince you that certain information isn't true. So libraries aren't just fighting to make sure you have access to the information you need. We're fighting to make sure you understand how to discern what is accurate information from misinformation. So I think that uh, the, state, the statement on the outside of our Carnegie building, free for the people, is, is important. We're free for the people and we're here for your access to information needs and to help you discern the information you need. Um, Deborah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure in, in, in your capacity um, as a director, um, you've talked to librarians not only around the country, but around the world. I imagine you have contacts around the world. So what do they say to you when they look at a study like the ALA just did releasing, re released recently about what's happening in, in the United States. What kind of re re reaction are you getting? In some cases, um, disbelief that it's happening in uh, a country that's often been held up as the ideal of democracy and freedom. Um, but a concern that um, that model of information control will confirm censorship that goes on in their own countries or their lack of ability to provide information in libraries that happens in their own countries. Um, often there's a striving to emulate um, what libraries have achieved in the United States. And when they see the, this effort by elected officials, um, political entities to limit access to information, they fear for the progress. Um, I note that uh, we put together something called the Intellectual Freedom Manual on uh, every few years we update it. Um, and it's a handbook of best practices and policies meant to enable free access to information and to enable each user to make their own choices about what they want to read. And it's translated into several languages. And I would be disheartened if we had to rewrite that to reflect the kind of restrictions we're seeing in this country and have that exported as a model of library service for other countries. Um, I, you know, I say it all too often, but, you know, we have uh, incredible freedom here in the United States that many countries don't enjoy. Uh, as you know, you had official censors in your newsroom right. and, and that is still going on in too many countries yes. today. And um, we need to cherish this freedom and protect it with all that we have. Um, and, you know, and remember that our libraries are where the locus for all of that to happen. I always call libraries the little engines of democracy um, because right. they do, as Aaron said, they make information available, but not only information available, but how to evaluate that information and how to equip oneself to engage um, in society um, and understand what's going on and how to enrich one's own life and the life of the community around you. And Erin, and, and I, I know the, the, the public library uh, uh, sort of uh, has a lot of, uh, organizes forums and hosts discussions on, on important topics, not just relating to the library, but in you know, other issues in the community. Um, is, is it time, and I don't know whether you've had a, a, this, this discussion about this book banning phenomenon and, and what's going on around the country, um, to give people, you know, sort of insight into not only what's happening, but also the dangers of this, of this kind of a movement? Well, I think that one of the things that our library, along with other libraries do is every year annually recognizing banned book suite, right. which I, I think sometimes is a misnomer for people. We actually had somebody recently say to us, why would you celebrate the fact that you're keeping these books off the shelf? And uh. so it's an opportunity for us to explain to folks what it is, but um, 
the American Library Association this year gave us a lot of talking points as librarians uh, in that celebration to say, no, we're celebrating the freedom to read. It's it's not about the books that have right. been banned. It's about the fact that we have the freedom to read. And so I think that um, at least in our organization, we tried to focus on that. We tried, despite that one person who was a little confused, we did try to uh, focus on the fact that you do have the freedom to read and you have the freedom to choose. And so we do have those conversations going on already because we have our librarians who, who put out displays and talk about what it means to be able to make that choice for yourself. So I, I think that libraries are already having that conversation and we're sure. already trying to inform people about, you know, we have a policy in place. We have a process in place. If you have a concern, talk with us and we'll we'll work with you. If you have a specific need and you're not finding it and you're frustrated, we will we will work with you to help you meet that need. And, and that's what your librarians are there for. We're there to help you meet your information needs. And so there's nothing better in the day of a librarian than when you come in with an open mind and a question and you're you're ready for us to help you find that answer. Right. As a final question. Um, to both of you, how optimistic or pessimistic are you as to the future, uh, given not only this growing movement um, against books, but on other is social issues as well in this country as the current uh, uh, election campaign is showing? Um, is, is there reason to worry? Is there reason for to be distraught? Uh, Deborah, I actually think that there's reason for hope. Um, we were concerned with the rise of these campaigns to remove books from schools and libraries that we had misgaged the, the temper of the public for the freedom to read. And so we did a survey um, um, with uh, some very uh, well-known and respected polling entities uh, to determine what voters and parents were thinking. And we found, and, and we're pleased to find out that of those polled, the vast majority opposed censorship across political parties, uh, uh, across age ranges. Um, they all disagreed with the idea that censorship should be a tool for government to control access to information, and particularly in regards to what's available in libraries. So I think I draw hope from that. Okay. Uh, it's a matter of um, you know, as we, we, you know, I think people were not aware of this campaign, uh, this effort to remove books, and they're beginning to mobilize around it. But I also draw hope from the young people. We hear from the young people who read, who use libraries, and they tell us that they cherish the books they find there, and they defend the freedom to read, and they've been willing to turn out at board meetings, at public rallies, uh, to defend their libraries and their librarians. And I look at that as our future and what to draw hope from. Um, and in the short term, you know, knowing that we're seeing a growing mobilization to counter um, <coughs> some of the that we've been seeing recently, and we may not succeed immediately or in the short term, but I think in the long term, we will prevail. Erin? Uh, I agree. I think that it's, um, it's not looking super bright right now for libraries everywhere. But as I said, I'm very lucky to be in the community that I'm in right now and that I'm very hopeful based on the you know conversations that we have, that when we can have a person-to-person -person conversation about the mission, vision, and values of the public library, people respond to the fact that we want to make information accessible for all. And while we recognize one viewpoint is not your viewpoint, that it might be something that somebody else wants to pick up. So I'm hopeful that because of those conversations and that ability to take that moment and provide some education about why public libraries do have, or school libraries do have, a variety of viewpoints. I'm hopeful that more and more people will have those one-on-one -on -one conversations and understand that uh, just because you don't want to pick up that book, it doesn't mean somebody else doesn't want to. Right. Well, Deborah and Aaron, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, this has been a very uh, illuminating, very thoughtful discussion. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, you know when we post it on, on YouTube and, and Facebook and other um, digital platforms, more people will pay attention to what's going on. And I think that's, that's the challenge. And as a, former, as a retired newspaper man who spent almost 50 years 
in the business, um, the loss of daily newspapers uh, is also a disturbing issue because these are the kinds of issues that the paper I worked for for four decades would be focusing on and giving attention to. And, and that, that avenue is being lost and, as well, and, and that is a disturbing uh, you know, sort of insight into what's happening in this country. But once again, thank you both, and uh, you know, I hope we be, stay in touch, and if there's anything more you know, I can do and, and we can do with this podcast uh, to deliver your message, uh, please get in touch and stay in touch with me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank